Welcome to this video resource. If you're new to Emmanuel or you don't know who I am, my name is Tom and I'm the youth pastor here at Emmanuel Church. This video resource is there to be an encouragement and a reminder of what was preached on on Sunday morning as we spend time in God's Word. Please understand that these videos are not meant to be there for a replacement for fellowshipping in your local church. And if you're in a situation where you're not attached to a local church, can we please encourage you to reach out to your local pastors or local church and get involved. Finally, it is our prayer that this video is a reminder for you from God's Word. And if you'd like to know more about the Gospel or Emmanuel Church, you can check out our website link down below. We really hope you enjoy this video. And our God will stand unshakable. The reading this morning is from the book of Jeremiah, chapter 1, verses 1 to 10. The words of Jeremiah, the son of Hilkiah, one of the priests living in Anoth, in the territory of Benjamin. The word of the Lord came to him in the thirteenth year of the reign of Josiah, son of Ammon, king of Judah. It also came throughout the days of Jehoiakim, son of Joshua, king of Judah, until the fifth month of the eleventh year of Zedekiah, son of Josiah, king of Judah, when the people of Jerusalem went into exile. The call of Jeremiah. The word of the Lord came to me. I chose you before I formed you in the womb. I set you apart before you were born. I appointed you a prophet to the nations. But I protested, oh no, Lord God, look, I don't know how to speak since I'm only a youth. Then the Lord said to me, do not say I am only a youth, for you will go to everyone I send you to and speak whatever I tell you. Do not be afraid of anyone, for I will be with you to rescue you. This is the Lord's declaration. Then the Lord reached out his hand, touched my mouth, and told me, I have now filled your mouth with my words. See, I have appointed you today over nations and kingdoms to uproot and tear down, to destroy and demolish, and to build and plant. This is the word of the Lord. Good morning, everyone. <coughs> Excuse me. Let's just pray. Father, this topic on missions is a scary topic. It is frightening. We're small, we're feeble. And we've heard today through Derek of persecution and what it means for many, many people around the world just like us. And yet here we are in a month on the subject of mission. And as we think about it and we pray about it, I thank you that for the reminder that in you alone 
is our only hope. May we cling to that as we examine our own lives in the face of your immense glory. Please go before us. Amen. Last week, if I can just recap for a moment, because as I hinted there, and you've got it up there, this is an entire month on the same subject. And as much as we want to give you a sermon or a service where, where you see all of the glory of God, we can walk away with the sure knowledge of your Savior, Jesus Christ. We also know that we are part of a series. We are really looking at this idea of mission. Where does it come from? What does it mean? What does it mean for us? Is it a subject that we all should take seriously? Or, or, or do we just have people like Brother Andrew if you haven't read the book, I encourage you to. He's an incredible guy. But Grant and Loki, last week, are, are, are they kind of the unique people? Or, or we kind of feel we're involved somehow, but how, I don't know. And so that is what we're tackling over a month. Please do the whole walk with us. At the end of the month, you'll get more information. I think it's the 25th, the last Wednesday. There's a panel discussion on Wednesday night to go further into this and to answer questions that many of you may have about this whole topic. So to recap last week, we looked at the life of Abraham and the first thing that comes out is the necessity to count the cost. I mean, Jesus said it. But we are so used to glorifying these characters, we miss how much Abraham had to count. It cost him a lot. And all through his walk that he followed God's call to go, to go, he was tripped up over and over again by the very things that were most valuable to him. And God was saying, let go. Let go. What was valuable to him was his own sense of safety. It was huge for him. He made some costly decisions along the way because he feared, like you and I do. Our safety is paramount to us. The thought of setting aside my safety and trusting in the Lord Jesus, my only hope, that his spirit is with me right now. What do I have to be afraid of? Well, Abraham was afraid. And he made some critical mistakes. He was no different to us. And secondly, the issue of heritage to him. Inheritance, legacy, to have a son, to carry on his name that he's not forgotten in the midst of time. That was huge for him. Over and over and over again, it was the issue, Lord, you promised me a son. I have no children. You promised, and now I'm a hundred. You've done nothing. Abraham took matters into his own hands. And God had to remind him and remind him and remind him. Had to give him a son and then tell him, go sacrifice your son. I am your only hope. But as much as he counted the cost, we are reminded at the end that God will raise us up is saying, you can trust me. Abraham, you can trust me with your son because I gave up my son in his place. As we consider missions, he's saying to us, you can trust me. Trust me. 
He's had a hard time drumming that into my head, and I don't think he's finished. Stephen, you can trust me. You can let go of your deepest hope and desire in this world and give it to me and say, and trust me, I will look after it. I will look after it. So that was the message last week. As we come to Jeremiah this week, we're going to look at the origins, the foundation of our call to mission. Where does it come from? On what authority? On what basis? And, and this is going to look different from each of us, for each of us. We're all going to have to go home and examine this thought. How am I called to mission, made for mission? What is that going to look like for me? So we're going to look at the example of Jeremiah here, the call on his life. And let's have a look at it. And, And particularly I'm zoning in on verses 4 and 5 for now. We'll later go further into the book to have a look at the implications on his life. But here we have the origins. To my shame, I was going to gloss over verse 4. I think the Lord's rebuked me. You cannot gloss over verse 4. The word of the Lord came to me. Why should God ever speak to us? Why? Why should he have ever created all of creation, all of heaven and earth, spoke it into being? Why? Why why should he have said, let there be light? So that at the point he gave us life, we could see the wonders of his creation. And we could go, wow. God, you are great. Why he spoke, and you will see it all the way through Jeremiah. The word of the Lord came to me. Why is it that that had to all be recorded for us? That we can hear on this Sunday, open this book, and have the word of the Lord given to us. We cannot afford to take that lightly. That God would choose to speak to us. And let's look at what he says to Jeremiah. Firstly, I chose you before I formed you in the womb. What a starting point for your life. Whatever you've been taught in school whatever you've been taught by your culture, by your upbringing. This is where God starts with Jeremiah. I chose you before I formed you. That chose, the original Hebrew, the word is yada. It's a beautiful word. Okay, you can repeat it over and over again. Nobody will understand what you're saying. Yada. Yada is actually, right at the beginning, is the word used of Adam. Adam yadded Eve, knew Eve, and she conceived a child. Adam knew his wife deeply, intimately, personally. And we have here God saying, Jeremiah, I knew you that well. Before you had any physical form, you were just a figment of my imagination. You were on my mind. You were in my will. I yadded you. I knew you. I can almost imagine Cad. I don't really know Cad. Computer-aided design, supposedly architects. 
shape and mold the thing they want to build on computer, and that means they can look at it from different angles, tweak it, no, this section's too big, this section's too small. I think we should go out a bit there. No, 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 pull that back. I imagine God looking at me in his mind like that, looking at me from all angles. Before he formed me, he knew me. That's where our lives start. Nowhere else but in the will of God. They didn't start at the procreation of your father and your mother. They started here, in the mind of God. Before you formed me in the womb. Now we know that's not the only place that language is used. David says it. Psalm 139, if you've never read it, read it to yourself. For it was you who created my inward parts. You knit me together in my mother's womb. Knit together. It's not something I do. My wife and daughter crochet. Please, I'm told you never get those two things confused. My mom-in-law knits. I can't tell you very much about it, except supposedly one's one needle and one's two needles. There we go. But we're not mass produced, that's for sure. God is described as someone who knit us together. He said, hey, there's an individual that I have made. So he chose us before he formed us. I set you apart before you were born. Moving to the next section. Before I was physically born, I was set apart. The various words that come out of the Hebrew, I was sanctified, I was consecrated from before my birth. He said, I've got you. I've got you. Before I even took breath, I've got you. Jeremiah was set apart. He was an Israelite. He was one of the people of God. From all the world of people, Jeremiah was set apart where God said, you will be one of my own. What's more? You will be the son of Hilkiah, one of the priests living in Anathoth in the territory of Benjamin. That was not accident. God says, I've set you apart. And God has said to you, I set you apart. to be one of my children. In the blood of Jesus Christ. I've set you apart for that. We'll go a step further just now. But that's a, that's a thought to just pause and ponder. Before I gave thought to anything, God set me apart. I walk in the confidence that Jesus made, or at least the Father made a decision about me. Set me apart for his son. For his son. And now we go that one step further. God says to Jeremiah, I appointed you a prophet to the nation. Now that is where it will be different for each of us who call Jesus our Lord and Savior. We're not all called to be appointed prophet to the nations. Not even the other prophets necessarily carried that title. God is saying, that, Jeremiah, is what I have for you. That is what I molded you together in my mind 
fulfill the purpose for which I made you. I decided that before you were a physical being. That's what I wanted for you. And he actually molded us, knit us together, crocheted us, maybe, into being for a purpose. It was not by accident that I was born on the 10th of June, 1974, in Cape Town, into the family of my father and mother, Philip and Charmian Lefebvre. God placed me there at that time in that place. Nothing about my life is an accident, and nothing about your life is an accident. You were knit together, you were formed, you were shaped for a purpose. And the appointing is, if you think about appointing, is a declaration. The day comes where God makes it known to us. This is what I have appointed you to. This is it. Notice straight away Jeremiah. And generally, Jeremiah's response is all ours. Oh no, Lord God. Verse 6. Look, I don't know how to speak since I am only a youth. No, Lord, actually, I'm not the right person. You've made a mistake. No, no, no. That actually, go back to your record books. I'm not that person. That is our response to God time and time and time again. That's the story of my life so far. You could write an entire biography on me about how many excuses I came up with to God. How many times I patted myself on the back. I said, heck, Lord, I was going to be a lawyer. I, I was one year away from qualifying. That's it. And Lord, for you, I gave that up and I became a teacher. Aren't I amazing? Gave up that wonderful salary. Don't you think, God? Don't you all think that was an amazing sacrifice moment? God should be impressed with me. He's made it abundantly clear ever since. I'm not impressed. <laughs> not in the least bit impressed, Steve. That's not all I'm going to ask of you. That's not all. So you resisted. And we resist for a multitude of reasons, but the ultimate is we're afraid. Let's just, let's just put that out there. We are afraid. And we look at verse 8. Do not be afraid of anyone, he says to Jeremiah, for I will be with you to rescue you. This is the Lord's declaration. And we go, yeah, yeah, yeah. I believe that. But we don't act like we believe that. I certainly have never felt like if I'm going to be honest, am I being recorded? I've never felt like he's going to rescue me. I've never felt like that. Intellectually, I believe that. I believe in Jesus Christ, the Son of God. That he died for my sins. That God loves me enough that he sent his son to die for my sins. And then just like he raised Jesus up on the third day, he will raise me up too. Does that change the way I live my life? Do I walk with a boldness and a confidence? because I know this to be true. Anyone who knows me will know that I more often than not act out of 
Yeah. And the Lord says, do not say, I am only a youth. For you will go to everyone I send you to and speak whatever I tell you. I made you for that purpose. You may think you know yourself better than anyone else. You're wrong. I know you better than you know yourself. That is the foundation we start at when we start talking about mission. We think it's a subject we can just take it or leave it. It's a deck of cards. Pick your card. And yes, there is something about mission that certain people are called to go to a foreign country like Grant and Loki to a people who have never heard the gospel, who don't have a written language. Grant's father is writing their language for them so they can have the Bible in their language. It's been said to me that he's in a race of time to get the Old Testament done. He's already done the new before he passes on to ensure those people have the word of God in their own language. But that's just them. And maybe not all of us are called to that. But the Lord said, I've set you apart. And I've appointed you. Better question would be, okay, Lord, what have you appointed me to? So let's look at how this panned out for Jesus. I mean, for Jeremiah. A very interesting story I want to take you to. It's in chapter 32 of Jeremiah. An event in Jeremiah's life. And let's just set the context. The first three verses of the chapter. This is the word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord in the tenth year of King Zedekiah of Judah which was the 18th year of Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar, the great king of Babylon, the superpower of the day. King Nebuchadnezzar was quite simply the most powerful man on the planet at that time. At that time, the army of the king of Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar, was besieging Jerusalem. The forces had gathered around like wolves, ready to pounce. And the prophet Jeremiah was imprisoned in the guard's courtyard in the palace of the king of Judah. We may ask, why was he imprisoned? King Zedekiah of Judah had imprisoned him, saying, why are you prophesying as you do? You say, this is what the Lord says. Look, I'm about to hand the city over to Babylon's king, and he will capture it. What God asked Jer Jer Jeremiah to say to the king and to the people was not popular. And so Jeremiah finds himself in prison. He's threatened by a force from the outside of Israel and a force from the inside. He's got enemies on every side. The, the nation is about to collapse. It looks like it'll be the end of Israel as we know it. And there isn't time to read through the whole story. You can look at it in your own time. But he gets requested to redeem a piece of land belonging to a relative of his. Won't you buy that land? Now, generally speaking, in Israel, they had a system that if you got into debt and you had to sell off your piece of land, in Israel, it still belonged to your clan. Okay? A kinsman could buy that piece of land back for you. Now, in different times, in different places, this rule operated differently. But Jeremiah was that kinsman. And that man approached him and said, won't you redeem my land? 
won't you spend money on this piece of land at this time when the king of Babylon is about to invade? Won't you spend your money on this land? Every, please agree with me, every piece of worldly wisdom would say, don't spend your money on that piece of land. This place is going to the dogs. That is a foolish investment. Have a look at verses 13 to 15. I charge Baruch in their sight. This is what the Lord of armies, the God of Israel, says. Take these scrolls, the, this purchase agreement, with the sealed copy and this open copy, and put them in an earthen storage jar so they will last a long time. But this is what the Lord of armies, the God of Israel, says. Houses, fields, and vineyards will again be bought in this land. When I was in my early 20s, Ellie and I just married. We had someone come and advise us on our investments. And he said, and I think it's common thinking, nothing wrong with it. He said, with your salary, at which stage that was very puny and I didn't think I could do anything with it, he said, you have to start thinking short term, medium term, long term. Okay? You, have to, you have to kind of make sure you've got money for your everyday needs, but then you must also make sure that you've got money maybe for your children's education, or maybe a car you're saving up for. But then you also need to make sure you have money for your retirement. Please tell me this teaching is not foreign to you. I hope you've all got your investments for the long term sorted out. Oh, don't, Ian, don't look like that. Okay? All right. Okay. What Jeremiah is here saying is we forget there is a God term, not a short, medium, or long term. Are you investing in God's kingdom to come? Are you doing that? Are you wisely and truly investing for that? Even if everything around you looks like it's going to the dogs. We know what it feels like. Everything that kind of has always been around, ESCOM, is crashing. Our politicians are corrupt. The potholes never seem to be fixed. Our mayors spend more time trying to keep their position than actually doing anything. Why would we invest? And he says... I appointed you. I appointed you. Invest your money in my kingdom, in my plans, in my vision that goes way beyond anything your financial advisor can tell you. Jeremiah buys that piece of land but this is what the Lord of armies, the God of Israel, says. Houses, fields, and vineyards will again be bought in this land. Your time, your money, put into the lives of the only things that are really going to matter for the future is the souls of human beings who desperately need to hear the gospel If they don't hear it, in the words of Hudson Taylor that drove him to be a missionary in China, was he woke up one night with this horrible thought that there were no missionaries going to inland China, and those souls were slipping into darkness without ever hearing the gospel. What a privilege that I've heard it from birth 
in the family in which I grew up in. What a glorious privilege. And he says, my kingdom is coming. Go be my witnesses. In Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the world. He says to Jeremiah, buy into my kingdom. Buy into my future. Not your own. Into mine. And the whole crutch of it comes at the end. Verse 44. Fields will be purchased. The transaction written on a scroll and seal. And witnesses will be called on in the land of Benjamin, in the areas surrounding Jerusalem and in Judah's cities, the cities of the hill country, the cities of the Judean foothills, and the cities of the Negev, because I will restore their fortunes. This is the Lord's declaration. He's saying, whatever you give up for me, whatever you let go of, Whatever mission you go on, whether your witness actually costs you your life, I will restore your fortunes. Do we live in the light of that? I wake up daily and ask myself that question. As I started last week, help me to answer that question as we do this month of missions. Last thing that I want to touch on. Finally, Nebuchadnezzar has his way with the city. There's a bit of backwards and forwards. He leaves the city for a while, he comes back, but ultimately he's going to destroy it. And all this time, Jeremiah is in prison. And at one point, he's thrown into a cistern. Oh, well, just left there to die. And it takes a Cushite man called Ebed Melech to save him. In human terms, Jeremiah's life and his witness is not going well. No one's listening to him. People would rather kill him. But we end with chapter 39. Verse 11, God is a God of the impossible. Speaking through Nebuchadnezzar, can't even pronounce the name, a heathen captain of the gods, King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon gave orders concerning Jeremiah. Okay, give that to them sort. The most powerful man in the world has special instructions for Jeremiah. Don't I feel good about myself now? Special, unique instructions. President of the U.S. says to his generals when they capture South Africa, Stephen, that guy, GQ, this is how you're to treat him. Take him and look after him. Don't do him any harm, but do for him whatever he says. So Nebuzaradan, captain of the guards, Nebuzaradan, the chief of staff, Nergal Shariza, the chief soothsayer, and all the captains of Babylon's king, had Jeremiah brought from the guards' courtyard, the prison, and turned him over to Gedaliah, son of Ahikam, son of Shaphan, to take him home. So he settled among his own people. None of us are home. None of us are. Whether we're on mission or not. If you're a follower of Jesus Christ, you are not at home. That home where you're going home to for your lunch after this service is not your home. It's a temporary shelter that God has given you for now which he could take away at any time. 
but it's not your own. He says, I'm going to take you, even if it looks impossible to you, I'm going to settle you amongst your own people. The day will come where I will take you home to be with me. And before my throne there is a vast multitude of people from every tribe and language and nation. That gives glory to me and to my son, Jesus Christ. That's your home. That's your home. And I will take you there one day. But until then, I've appointed you. I've commissioned you. Incredibly, he was given the option. You can come to Babylon, first world nation, pretty comfortable in Babylon. I'm actually taking all the leaders of your nation away with me to Babylon. Or you can stay here. There are no leaders left here. There's no infrastructure left here. I've destroyed the temple. I've destroyed all the things you love, but you can stay here. There are people here, poor, vulnerable, orphans and widows. Jeremiah chose to stay and not go to Babylon. His call to go was actually one to stay. He stayed. If you want a sobering afternoon of reading, go and read Lamentations. Jeremiah wrote that about the time that he stayed with the people left in the land. If we think we've got it bad, it was bad. He talks about such hunger in the streets, children wandering the streets, looking for a mouthful to eat, getting to the point that nursing mothers chose to eat their children because there was nothing else to eat in the land. And right in the middle of Lamentations, Jeremiah says this, right in the middle of the most extreme economic hardship because of the Lord's faithful love, we do not perish. For his mercies never end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. I say, the Lord is my portion. Therefore, I will put my hope in him. Guys, if you're a believer today, Jesus is your portion. We are called to put our hope in him. Not just say it, not just think it, but live our lives that way. This country can go to the dogs. There can be no food to eat. Our lives may at be risk because of our witness to the blood of Jesus Christ. But our hope is in Jesus and the home that awaits us. With him forever and ever. As we come to mission, let's get our perspective right. There's nothing for us here. But our brothers and sisters, and those who don't yet know Jesus, need us to respond to whatever it is that the Lord appoints us to. Let's pray. Father, it is amazing to know that you are our God. That we're not just accidents in the universe.
that you knew us before you formed us. You set us apart before we were born and you have appointed us. You pointed us firstly to eternal life in your son Jesus Christ. But then you've appointed us into the mission field, the harvest field of your kingdom. Until you call us home, may our lives be lives lived in the light of this kingdom. Amen. Amen to that.